Um, bonjour, Michael. Bonjour, Laureline. And bonjour, Kevin. Oh, how, how are you three? Good in this virtual space today? Very good. Thank you. Good. Thank you, merci. It's, um, it's, a, it's a different world that, that we live um, in, in the last uh, year. And, um, and it was the first big conference for organizing and you're our first big panel. So um, it's a first to first. And um, we're, we're going to take uh, some, some time to share with each one of you. Um, Michael, I have a first question for you. Um, and um, it, it's about your amazing company. Um, Lens Attack uh, was in the top 50 in the CNBC disruptive disruptor companies um, by, by Forbes. You're, you're also featured as, as one of the five companies which is going to solve the age of waste. That's a big, huge ambition here um, and, um, and giving us a lot of hope. Uh, you're in the 50 hottest companies he invents bioeconomy for, for the third year running. Uh, what's the magic at Lensatech? What, what's, what's unique and disruptive that, that you're able to, uh, to, to be so well recognized, sir? Well, first of all, thanks thanks to be here. I think uh, very excited to be joining this this panel and this event. I think um, hopefully next time in in person. <laughs> and yeah, thanks thanks for all the, the. I mean, we're very excited about all the accolades uh, that that we recently get. I think, um, but but more importantly, I think uh, the impact that we can already make today. I think uh, it's, it's been actually a very long wait for us to get to this point. I think we started our journey 15 years back. Um, and the company was, was really founded with the idea that if we want to make an impact and broadly compete with, with petrochemical production routes, uh, with our bar manufacturing approach, I think we have to, to really make use of abundant low-cost feedstocks such as waste or carbon oxides. And I think uh, biology, we feel felt this is really uniquely suited for that. It certainly helps that I think more recently, I think there's, there's an increased public focus also on the climate crisis and, and carbon capture and carbon utilization technologies are kind of uh, more center and I think uh, much, much needed. Um, but what really makes us, I think, uh, unique is that we have uh, commercial technology that we can offer today. I think we, since, since about two years, we're operating our first commercial plant in, in China where we produce ethanol from off gases from the steel industry. And, and by doing that, we've, we've produced over 20 mi million gallons of, of ethanol, but also mitigated over 100,000 tons of, of CO2. And we actually have uh, several additional plants under construction now. In simple terms, I think you can imagine the process a bit like a brewery, but instead of sugars and hops and yeast, we use uh, anaerobic autotrophic bacteria that can use uh, carbon oxide that we feed to the process uh, con continuously. What really makes the process is unique is it can handle uh, fluctuating gases, which I think uh, catalytic approaches really have, have, have challenges with, and, but the biology can handle and also contaminants in those gases. And we can use a broad array of, of feedstocks and make a broad array of products. So we can, for example, use industrial off gases, whether it's steel mills or processing plants, but we can also use uh, urban waste that's unsorted that we can gasify and, and ultimately, I think, uh, working towards utilizing CO2 enabled by all the renewable electricity and green hydrogen now available to, to power this. On the other hand, on the product side, I've demonstrated over 100 products today already. And the first few of that we are rolling out commercially is as and always producing. I think we did, uh, that can bo go both into the fuel but chemicals market, um, but also jet fuel is something that, that we had first demonstration flights and uh, chemicals like important bulk chemicals like acetone and isopropanol are also very close to, to rolling out, as long as also materials like, like PET. So I think uh, what, what's really exciting to me is also more and more that, that is, is ending up in, in consumer products. Um, to really enable that, I think we had to develop a, a synthetic biology platform. And 10 years ago, those microbes or those class of microbes were generally considered to be genetically inaccessible. We had to develop all those tools for the organism. And it's, it's, it's a very kind of uh, difficult to, to engineer organism. It's an anaerobic organism. so it's, it's it, it uh, can, cannot uh, 
take any oxygen. So as, as you can imagine, it's, it's quite difficult to develop tools for that. So we can now do automated high throughput strain engineering in context of an anaerobic environment and also flammable gases like hydrogen and, and, and carbon monoxide. Um, and likewise, I think on the process side, I think we also had to develop uh, a lot of new reactor technology to get those gases in, into the liquid so it can feed to the microbe. So there's been a lot of process development, both on the biology, but also on the engineering side. All right, you're, 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 uh, you're, you're very hands-on, <laughs> pragmatic production, get to, get to the factory, get to scale is the, is the heart of, of what I'm hearing um, in, 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 a, in a very scalable way. Uh, doing business production in China must not have been the simplest thing. Um, Laura Lin, um, you, you're in the U.S. There, there is 450,000 brownfield, um, brownfield meaning areas that are toxic sites or, or close to toxic. Mm -hmm. And and they they cover you know states like New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. Uh, they're deep. They're horrifying. It's like a horror movie. Um, and and you're you're uh, you're addressing that specific issue. Um, how is this currently handled? And and why will bio make such a big difference in the cleanup of um, of this this mess left behind by by I should say my generation and older. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. And first, let me take the opportunity to thank you for the, this invitation and the opportunity to join this wonderful panel. And you're right, the 450,000 brownfield sites. It's a glaring reminder that as we establish the circular economy, there's some significant problems left over from the extractive linear economy. So right now, governments are regulating the public health threats from toxins like PCBs. Government legislation is forcing landowners and industries to clean up these contaminants before they can sell the properties or develop them. Unfortunately, due to gaps in technology and costs, the vast majority of these brownfield sites are left untreated, destroying land values and slowing economic growth. And when a decision is made to clean up a site, often the go-to solution, more often than not, is cut and haul. So that means that they go and dig up the contaminants, transport them often hundreds of miles, and landfill them. But that's not solving the problem. That's relocating and burying it. At Allied Microbiota, you know, we want to disrupt this narrative. We are by developing advanced microbes to clean up environmental contamination up to 80 times faster and four times cheaper than traditional methods. And our technology is sustainable. In fact, we address nine of the UN sustainability goals, paving the way for a waste-free future. And as we scale up and move to treating contaminants on site, we will become cost competitive with landfill making it an easy choice to solve the problem, not bury it. Fantastic. The economics of land fields will disappear and, um, and your technology is going to uh, help us solve that, um, that problem. And, and, and yeah. those, uh, those that you are engineering are, are soon going to hit market. That's great. Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to um, ask you guys, the three of you, uh, um, questions to share in discussions, but, but right now I like Kevin. Kevin, we've known each other for, for a, a long time. Um, when you started Hyacinth Bio uh, a few years back, we, we met, you guys were, were just getting going, um, and now you've reached a, a significant investment level. Um, what for you is, uh, has been key to, to being able to get to, to the bio manufacturing scale of things? And, and to do this in a, in a, in a sustainable way. Uh, we know that the cannabis market is growing, but what made you first and what's making you scalable, Kevin? Yeah, I can point to a few different things. Um, so, I mean, the, the biggest thing of course, is that, you know, we're growing yeast, we're not growing cannabis here. Um, we don't involve cannabis plants in any aspect of our process um, and the fermentation there's a number of advantages to using fermentation to produce things as opposed to like 
you know, cannabis cultivation. Um, one of our key priorities has been to use yeast as a host organism and have a universal process which you can outsource to contract manufacturers. And so, you know, we can have operations running here in Canada, in the US, in Europe, kind of all at once and have it all be extremely reliable uh, and extremely uh, high quality. Um, like the fermentation industry exists, it's kind of a backbone for a lot of ingredient production. And we want to use that backbone to supply these unique, you know, new products in uh, in the cannabinoid field that are that are just emerging as like really, really interesting um, healthcare, uh, healthcare products. Um, so I think, I mean, there's a couple of key things, you know, beyond just focusing on creating the universal process. One of the key things that we have done that gets a bit more technical is that um, instead of uh, you know, you can think a bit intuitively about genetics and say like, oh, you can take the genetics from cannabis, put those into a yeast cell and the yeast cell will grow. It'll produce the same cannabis things thing that cannabis does, uh, so on and so forth. Um, one of the things that we did in our early days was to actually look beyond the cannabis genome and into genomes of slime molds and bacterias and try to find genetic components from those organisms that will produce the same compounds as the cannabis plant will in the end. So actually a number of our, I guess a lot of our genes aren't coming from the cannabis plant actually in the end we found more efficient ones um and a key component is that uh uh if you look at just the cannabis uh plant genetic pathway for producing thc you'll see 11 different steps to get from uh sugar to, to thc in our case we've reduced that down to three steps using one particular enzyme that we found from a slime mold um and altogether, we've analyzed, discovered thousands of different genes that are all related to cannabinoid production, and that's all part of our innovation and our development of our process. Um, we also have teams that are focused just on the development of the fermentation process, you know, using, figuring out what temperature, what to feed our yeast and all this other stuff, kind of working the whole, you know, picture of, you know, first engineering the yeast genetic uh, components, and then also engineering the process components. Um, and all these things together are, you know, have come together over the past, like, you know, many years of development. Uh, to where we are today, where we are starting to like outsource our manufacturing and um, and start to sell sell actual amounts of product, right? Well, that's fantastic. It, it sounds like you're you're not a cannabis company, but you're 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 basically telling us you're 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 a speed um, speed engineering company to get back the thematic of of the of, <laughs> our, of our opening speaker here, um, and um, that that's really cool. Um, congratulations. Um, Kevin and Laura Lynn, you you both came from from uh, laboratories, um, sh shall I say, from from university or research environments. You're uh, you're a lap to market stories in in both cases. What was the biggest challenge in 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 lap to market in in your context of life science? Uh, what what makes it tough in life science, Kevin, and and in um, and, and particularly uh, in clean tech for for Laura Lynn? Maybe Kevin, since you were speaking. Um, last yeah definitely um i guess there's always with startups there's like a million challenges and every single one is like super important so it's hard to pick a uh the key most important one i think um one of the really fun and interesting challenges that we had to deal with was related to regulations around cannabinoids so that's all like brand new but like regulations got invented in canada for the cannabis industry right and one of the cool things that we did is that we made sure that we submitted to all of the public consultations around this regulation. We made sure the government knew that like, oh, cannabis don't just come from cannabis plants, they come from yeast as well. And so actually, if you look at the regulation in Canada for the definition of cannabis, it's the cannabis plant and anything that's found inside of it, regardless of how you actually make it. Uh, and they gave us like a big advantage in terms of how we think about going to market where we don't have to create our own regulatory path anymore. We fit into the existing regulatory path that got created. And that, that was awesome. That was like a super cool thing. And we heard later on that like, you know, the government was receiving our feedback and it was part of the discussion that was happening behind closed doors and stuff. So that was awesome. Um, I think the other big portion of the story is like, how do you think about, you know, your investors? How do they understand what you're working towards? How do you justify, of course, you know, we're focused a lot on R and D. We're gonna spend a lot of time developing our biotechnology and creating something that is gonna be exponentially better than anything that's out there today. Mm -hmm. And you know, getting that from your scientific brain into like more the investor mindset um, was also a huge learning curve in those earlier days. And a lot of life sciences companies, you know, really depend on that. You know, they have to. Uh, it's more about the technology than it is about just like trying to generate ten percent more revenue next month, kind of thing, right? Yeah. Or definitely. So, so two two key words. One one is regulations, regulations, 
and and the other one is um is is think of your investors you you need money to get to your next phase and they they need to relate to to your big picture uh laura lynn your, yourself yeah yeah no that's a really good question um how to scale a startup and lab studies have shown that allied microbiota sumo o technology can address a, a wide range of contaminants in soil, air, and water. And you know, many of these contaminants, there are so many of them and such large market opportunities. It's really a blessing and a curse, right? We're, we're a small startup and we don't have the funds to scale multiple verticals in parallel, but, but where do you start, right? And you know, we've made the decision to focus on PCB contaminated soil as the market that most accessible uh, to our technology and the fastest route to market. And you know, I think that a, a lot of startups face this challenge. You know, what is the best product market space? You know, which markets are most accessible to your technology? Um, what approach will get you funding you need to survive and get your product into the hands of the customers? Um, you know, so that's I think that's faced by a lot of startups, but you know, that being said, there are challenges, you know, specific to the clean tech space, you know, the, the environmental remediation space is huge, it's large, it's complicated, and there are a lot of players. And we have to figure out where do we fit into that existing food chain. And it's also a pretty conservative industry, you know, people want to see that your product works in the field, you know, and it's like a chicken and egg story. Right? How do you get those case studies to show that your product works without someone giving you the chance to go onto their site and do a pilot test of your technology? So if anybody's listening out there who has a PCB problem, please reach out to me. Yeah, I, I, uh, I hear you. The, the, the resources are limited in the startup phase and, and focus, focus, focus is, uh, is definitely the, the key. However, you need to um, have those that you focus on listen to you and and um, invite you with open arms and and work with you and give you tangible projects because you can find investors but you won't find investors if you don't have a a material context so so yeah tough um michael you you are uh, um you know more in the scale level of things uh lenstech um, includes, you know, plants in China, as you were telling us, and in, in, in groundbreaking projects. I think you have projects with Virgin Atlantic, if, if I, if my reading is correct, and in, in, in the world of, of jet fuel, uh, that, that's pretty impressive. W what makes, you know, what makes a startup go from startup to scalable company? Uh, what, what's, what's the key in, in when you get to the, to the much bigger level here? Yeah, no, I think, uh, I mean, first of all, I think the, the scale up is, is, is I think something that's, that's super exciting to see. I mean, the microbes that we develop at lab scale, seeing those employed at uh, 500,000 plus liter scale, I think that, that, that's super exciting. Um, I think uh, with, with that said, I think scale up is, is really hard and really difficult to, to that scale. I think, uh, first of all, I think it's, it's, it's quite expensive. I think uh, oftentimes I think you hear kind of uh, valley of death. I think, and, and I think it's, uh, it's the technology is relatively mature, but then you need, especially with the first of its kind technology like ours, you need someone then to, to take the risk and build the first plan. And I think, uh, you had mentioned China, so there's uh, certainly some risks there involved, but I think it enabled us to get to the market quickly. So I think uh, we're really grateful about uh, kind of uh, all the partnerships that supported us to get to that scale. With that being said, I think we operated, I think, over 100,000 hours of, uh, of uh, pilot and demonstration plants and, and several units across the, the globe before we got to the uh, starting the first commercial plant. So I think that that was a long way in kind of proving that that first of its kind technology. I think now that we have that in place, I think it's, it's much easier for the next products coming through to scale that up. Um, for, for sugar fermentation, I think it's, uh, there's some, uh, for example, fermentation tollers that, that can help de-risking that stage. Uh, so I, I would argue it's, it's probably not not enough for I think the, the hopefully the technologies that we can see come seeing through. 
Um, but for gas fermentation, it, it really did not exist and we had to develop a lot our own. So I think it started from reactor systems that we have to develop um, and, and all the different kinds around the process. So it's, it's hopefully something that, that we can give back and help others uh, going forward as, as, as well. I think in, in retrospect, one thing that I think was, was for us really important and, and helpful was I think the interplay between both scientists and engineers. I think from the get go, I think we had probably as many scientists as engineers in the, in the company. And I think we've actually built our first pilot unit when we still had marginal production levels in, in the lab. But I think that that really kind of uh, was, was crucial later on. And from the get go, I think we started on, on real world gases. So for example, we bottled gases at a steel mill site and brought that to our labs. And I think that for all the demonstration and pilot unit were in context of, of real gas streams. So I think that that was really important, I think, uh, and making sure that uh, that you operate in kind of real world conditions. Also, water is, is a big another, uh, component after, after I think the, the carbon, I think recycling as many as much water as, as you can, for example. And then there's the regulatory challenges, I think, as, as Kevin also mentioned, I think uh, with, with technologies that's maybe not on the radar, they're maybe outside of, of current regulation. And then especially working globally, working across different countries that all have different regulatory uh, frameworks and also particularly then also scaling up GMO strains to that level, which, which I think hasn't been done in, 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 uh, in, in across, across the globe. And I think every country has somewhat different processes there that is often hard to, to predict. And I think it's, it's, it's out of your hand, I think the timeline. So I think this is all things that that one needs to to kind of consider when when going that journey. Just quickly yeah. coming back to the chat fuel business, we're actually very excited. I think we spun out uh, this as a separate new business. I think um, just uh, I think half a year ago as as Lancer Chat. So I think this is really again to to kind of accelerate the speed we can get to to market with that. And I think we have uh, a lot of great uh, in investors there and a lot of airlines support there. That's really exciting, um, giving us, um, I can't wait to get on a plane that uh, tells me I'm, uh, I, I'm uh, the fuel from, uh, from Lensatex. Um, the, the, you know, going back to your core points, your core points were uh, um, engineering as close to scientists as possible, as early as possible, because you need to make all this uh, a scalable reality from a, from a production uh, perspective. Uh, you were linking up with uh, with with our friend with our friends on on the regulatory aspect. Wh whatever you decide to focus on, be very knowledgeable on on the regulations and and move move as as upstream as you can on this. And uh, and um, and the excitement, yeah. This this jet fuel, you're you're uh, you know, I I wanted this conference to happen because uh, I want people to. Uh, to believe in the bioeconomy and and to dream about it and to uh, to jump in and get stuff done. Well, you're you're definitely motivating us. Where, where do you guys think? And, and the quite the floor is open. Where, where do you guys think that the the next milestone in synthetic biology is is in synthetic manufacturing? Some like to call it. Some call it. You know, the alternative uh, protein world. Um, where do you see it go as as a big picture? Make us dream. Laura, Laura Lynn, you want to start? Yeah, no, I'll, I'll start. And, and you're right, the, the pace of progress is just so amazing. Like, when I was at school at Queens, you know, I remember I was learning how to stitch together, manually stitch together pieces of DNA in the emerging field of molecular biology. And we were working mainly with E. coli because the other hosts, we didn't have the technologies to transform it. And now I look at where we are and almost anything's possible and you know it really gives me reason to to dream that that we can harness the power of biology to so that we can make environmental cleanup we can clean up these environmental toxins you know so fast and so cheap that we can clean them up as they're being made and then we have enough bandwidth that we can then go and address this enormous backlog of historic contamination so we can have a clean environment for everyone yeah so you're making his dream about a, a clean earth clean sustainable earth 
and and you, Michael and Kevin, who who wants to jump in? <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I think I'm, I'm convinced it's going to be kind of uh, the, the age or century of, of, of biology. I think biology can really do things no other human-made technology can do, operates at, at from nanoscale to, to kind of gigascale. And I think uh, there's things that I think uh, we cannot kind of, uh, you know, human-made technology can do. But I think it's, it's I think there's this kind of unlimited potential at the same time i think it, it's really important to show near-term success stories i think to, to kind of keep the the kind of uh, interest and excitement in in, in in this field i think uh, i mean it, it's, it's exciting on all on all different kinds of level i mean the, the vaccine development stories this has been also i mean that, that that's amazing it wasn't kind of uh, possible even two years ago i think um it also shows how important I think partnerships is, and I think uh, probably don't want everything reinventing. I think uh, we probably want to leverage as, as much as, as possible as, as kind of our economy. And I think also the interplay then with, with for example, chemistry. I think there's things that chemistry is, is very good at. So I think the combination of chemistry and biology can be very powerful. And then also seeing what kind of, uh, yeah, artificial intelligence uh, now being apl applicable, applied to, to biology and we can generate data sets that, that kind of uh, can can be useful for that. So there's, there's a lot of, of potential that I think um, will be very exciting to, to see. Yeah, I, I, I've been following now biology as, as a sweet spot for a few years. And, and one of the things that, that's been um, very, you know, obvious is, has been the uh, the the transport, I would say, of the knowledge and experience of of you know startups, entrepreneurs, but also growing companies to scale coming from the IT world. I'm seeing more and more collision between the the IT world, um, whether it's AI or just IT in general, um, at, at all sorts of level, be it investors or technical people moving into this uh, into this space. And I, and I also see this this multidisciplinary collision. Um, yeah, the, this this collision of bio with with other spaces is is going to bring us to places. I think you know, I I don't want to quote the um the, the Star Trek theme, but um, I'm I'm in the mood. Kevin, <laughs> what's your thinking? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, those are all all excellent points. I think the cool idea that I can put out there for the audience, like maybe audience members, or maybe you to yourself, Savvy, uh, in your career, like you've seen, you've lived through like a bunch of career paths, you've seen a lot of things, uh, seen a lot of companies, you've seen a lot of products get made and manufactured, whatever. I think people, you know, looking at synthetic biology can start to imagine like, you know, uh, like a, an executive at like a phone company can think about like, oh, maybe I can make the screen for my phone using a biotech system as opposed to a chemical manufacturing system. And what does that mean for my products? Or can I imagine like a phone screen that is better than the one that I have today, which is, you know, uh, the one today is limited by chemical manufacturing. Like, can we imagine a better material that can be created using a biological system? There's a number of companies today that are kind of like on that, that fringe of things, right? Um, with cannabinoids, uh, of course, it's the same thing. Like we can make the cannabinoids that exist in the cannabis plant. We can also make cannabinoids that don't exist in the cannabis plant. And those can be better uh, products, better for healthcare, better for uh, treating different conditions um, that you know can't be made using a chemical system. They can only be made using a biological system that we've invented. Um, and today, you know, we're in this time frame where uh, it's become so much easier within such a short frame of time that this is the kind of the revolution. It's like, you know, uh, we're not assembling plasmids by hand anymore. We have robots or we just order them online and they ship faster than Amazon or something like that. You know, there's some crazy stuff that's happening nowadays that just didn't, didn't exist before. Um, so you can start to, you know, have these dreams and, and instead of those just being dreams, those, they can actually become realities within, you know, months and, and not within like, you know, 20 years. There's, there's some fundamental changes there that are happening, which is all, all very, very cool. Yeah, I, I share. What, one of the things, though, I see is is um, is is we need visions to to overcome some of the challenges. For for example, I've seen a lot of of um, you know, oddly enough, uh, referring I think to what Michael you were, you said earlier. There's some big production capacity out there. There's some big industrial infrastructures. I I, I think it was you, Kevin, that said that that there's there is a, a fermentation world. Um, it's been around for for a few centuries actually. And, and to a large scale. On the other hand, I see a lot of stuff at very small scale. I see a lot less of a, of a you know, how do you jump from your very small scale to your very large scale? 
I see that as one of the challenges in, in the next 10 years. And therefore, I see a lot of innovation is going to happen there. Um, people that are, are uh, being able to produce stuff that, that you know, allow the, the different dreams to go through, <laughs> through steps of scaling. Um, how do you guys see it? Um, what, what do you see in the next 10 years um, that, that is going to uh, uh, be in it, where innovations are needed to, to get our audience to, to, into action here and to help to, to get them to help us solve some of these, these major problems? No, I, can, no, I think I it's, you're right on spots with, I think infrastructure is, is something that I think is, 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 is something that's, that's really important to build out. So I think uh, biology actually has, has an advantage that it can be distributed, which I think it's, uh, it does not need to have that kind of economy of scale that I think big refineries have, though, though it can, it, it certainly can, but uh, it can also be distributed. But I think uh, Building out that infrastructure and I think uh, scaling up, as I mentioned, is, is expensive. So I think uh, supporting that and having new technologies accelerating and going faster to, to market is I think something that's going to be, 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 be really important. Yeah, I think the only thing I'll add to that, I guess the number of technologies that are going to be interesting in terms of like, you know, revolutionizing how we do synthetic biology today. Like today, of course, we can order DNA online. Like maybe tomorrow we can, uh, uh, I can sit at my desk and I can just print it out on like a printer or something like that, you know, uh, that's in my house. There's, you can imagine like where, where these things might start to take place. Um, but I think uh, one of the interesting things, uh, speaking of infrastructure is, of course, it's been years that there's been talk in Canada, especially about like, oh, how do we create bioeconomy? Can we invest in more infrastructure? So on and so forth. Um, and I think meanwhile, there's there's always infrastructure available for like pipelines. You know, we can always find a few billion dollars to build the next pipeline or convince some politician that this is a good idea or whatever. Uh, and uh, or there's like mining as well. Same thing. You can, you know, build mines. People know how to build mines and get, you know, gold out of the ground or whatever. Um, but, you know, maybe that's equally speculative or equally as you know, risky as uh, investing in biological infrastructure, where it's like investing in the labs, the tools that need to be uh, be there to kind of create the organisms, investing in the infrastructure that's needed to produce those new products at large scales. Um, and having that, uh, that capacity is going to be key for like kind of the future of the economy. And right now, you know, there's certain parts of the world you can imagine where like this, this infrastructure seems to centralize a bit um, and Canada does have like some going on, um, but perhaps that becomes a much easier thing or because perhaps that becomes the next political agenda where it's not really about people arguing about which pipelines are going to build where it's more about like, you know, who's going to build the biggest bio manufacturing facility and what products are they going to be able to make that are going to kind of change the global industry or something like that. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. The 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 um, well, I'll I'll break a bit of a news to you. Um, we some of us are are believers that that we should have a, a biomanufacturing institute is how we're calling it now. But but it's its major role is going to be lobbying government and uniting different parties to to create big projects. So so big bio high speed projects is what we we all are dreaming about and trying to get our hands around. But but yeah, it's a challenge. And 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 you um, are are, are uh, your advice, um, Laura, Laura Lynn. What 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 would it be, or what do, what do you see the big challenge is going to be? I think we've made huge progress, and I think there's still a lot of need for for governments to step in and provide the financial incentives and the regulations to to kind of encourage and, and promote the, the sustainable bio solutions and get them off the that bottom floor into the mainstream. And I think we've made huge advances in kind of miniaturizing, you know, the, the biology where we can develop processes at small scale and then move them up to larger scale. I think we need to do more of that. And, and then the whole cell-free biology system where we can look at entire pathways and, and optimize you know, the pathways and the enzymes and put them back into the organisms to make the products. I think we're starting there. We've made great strides, but we, we need to do more. And the whole interface of chemistry and biology and physics, the whole modeling, like, like how does 
how does a microbe, how does an enzyme break down a contaminant? What is that interface between the, the enzyme and the contaminant? And I think by, by really encouraging that, that interaction between the physics, the chemistry, the AI, and building on that, we can really accelerate our progress.